Felix Mitchell is not the most famous black gangster from a small American city called Oakland, but his relative obscurity in wide circles is more of an anomaly because this drug dealer was an innovator in the business and many of his inventions are still used by American gangsters today. He kept Oakland in his power for almost 10 years and after his death, he was included in sociology and criminalistic textbooks, becoming the reason for the term Mitchell's Paradox. And if you're wondering why he deserved it, then meet Felix the Cat Mitchell on the other side of the law. Felix Mitchell was born August 23, 1954 in Oakland, California. His childhood was spent in the neighborhood of San Antonio Village, notorious for the fact that out of 131,000 houses located in it, about half of them were considered uninhabitable. It was the ultimate ghetto. During the Second World War in Oakland, quickly developed industry opened many factories oriented on military order, and they needed cheap labor. Therefore, a huge number of black people from the south of the country moved to Oakland, but after the war, all these factories closed. People became unemployed and the government could not solve this problem, which led to extreme poverty and increased crime. Felix was born into a large family. He had five brothers and sisters. According to his memories, Felix did well in school but dropped out at the age of 17. Instead of sitting at a desk, Felix started selling drugs. Felix first sold marijuana in neighborhoods around the local Oakland Coliseum Stadium. Felix was also rumored to be a pimp, but this is more of a legend that came later. Due to Mitchell's fondness for flashy outfits, a fur coat or a long leather coat, expensive sunglasses, a gold chain, which was selected on the principle of the bigger the better. This is how pimps of that time dressed, wishing to show others that in front of them stands a solid man. There is no evidence that Mitchell was engaging in pimping, but the style of clothing pimps wore was clearly to his liking. Around the same time, Felix received a nickname which will accompany him for the rest of his life, Felix the Cat, in honor of the eponymous cartoon character which was created by Pat Sullivan. Felix had a lucrative marriage. His wife's sister was married to a local criminal mastermind, Tutti Rees, who, according to rumors, was involved in drug dealing in Oakland since the mid-60s. He paid attention to the promising kid, and from then on, Felix traded not only pot, but also heroin. Trading in the central neighborhoods of Oakland was quite dangerous, so Felix decided to focus on the streets where he grew up. At first, he enlisted his many relatives and friends to sell heroin. Over time, the group grew to include about a hundred people. The gang was called 69 Mob. The gang owed its moniker to the name of the street where most of the gang members grew up. Felix was able to organize an efficient and innovative system of selling for the times. Goods and money could not be kept by one person. One member of the chain would accept money from the buyer, while another in another location would hand over the goods. Individuals were responsible for the safety of all participants in the process. From the outside, it would seem that the sellers did not even know each other. Over time, this business model was adopted by many drug dealers but Felix was the first to implement it. Felix himself conducted his business from a fortified apartment, which was always guarded by armed guards. Felix also took security seriously. The block between 65th and 69th Avenue was turned into a real fortress. Those who wanted to get into it could do so only by agreeing on their visit in advance. Those who violated this rule were severely beaten. Once, the gangster member even beat up a man because he came to visit his sister without informing anyone. This was not enough for the criminals. As an example to the rest of the neighborhood, the victim's sister was also beaten. On the roofs of the highest houses, Felix placed teenagers who monitored the surrounding roads and, if necessary, alerted their older comrades about approaching cars with police officers or members of enemy gangs. However, the police rarely came into the neighborhood. Felix realized that the prosperity of his business depended on the loyalty of the locals, so he did everything he could to keep them happy. Mitchell and his associates could often be seen handing out toys, food, and pocket money to teenagers. He distributed food to the poor, and almost everyone on 69th Avenue was poor and organized parties for young people. Felix himself preferred to lead a wealthy lifestyle. He had his own fleet of expensive cars. He liked to wear bright and flashy clothes. Mitchell acquired prestigious real estate throughout the state and often flew to Europe for the weekend. 
Felix was also partial to the opposite sex. It is known that he had seven children from eight different women. The organization grew so fast that very soon Mitchell was not selling heroin in his neighborhood alone. He shipped his product to major California cities like Vallejo and Sacramento, and even out-of-state Detroit. By some estimates, from 1976 to 1983, when his organization was at its peak, Mitchell earned up to half a million dollars a week. Of course, Mitchell's thriving business attracted attention. He was first noticed by the Black Panthers, a left-wing radical black civil rights organization. It was headquartered in Oakland and was also intolerant of drug dealers. The leaders of the Black Panthers believed that drugs were a tool to enslave black people. However, that did not prevent them from taxing all local drug dealers. There were also rumors that the leaders of the movement hated drugs only in words. Periodically, the information appeared in the press that one of the leaders of the Black Panthers, Huey Newton, used cocaine. By the mid-70s, the Black Panther movement had fallen on hard times. The organization needed large sums of money that it could spend on charity and legal fees. Huey Newton, upon learning that an enterprising fellow on 69th Avenue was making nearly half a million dollars a week, decided to force him to pay tribute. But the Panthers were strongly rebuffed. The Panther extortionists were able to escape the battlefield unscathed, but blood was still spilled that day. The Mitchell boys, in pursuit of the fleeing Panthers, mistakenly fired on a van they thought contained the extortionists. Instead of extortionists, the van contained some random Mexicans, but Mitchell's gang got away with it. In time, however, they managed to come to an agreement and made a truce with Newton, while paying the amount demanded. He did not intend to fight with the Black Panthers. On the contrary, they caused him to feel a sense of respect because of the iron discipline reigning in their ranks. In the future, his relationship with the Panthers would become so warm that their representatives even attended his funeral. Mitchell devoted a great deal of time to the criminal education of his subordinates. He loved movies and, according to his memoirs, repeatedly forced members of his gang to watch action movies and dramas on the subject of organized crime. He especially admired Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather. With the help of this film, he tried to instill in his assistants the concept of honor and mutual responsibility. It is worth recognizing that Mitchell succeeded. Mitchell had enemies not only in the Black Panthers, for almost his entire career, Mitchell had to fight numerous competitors. Two organizations stood out among them, the Mickey Moore Gang and the Funktown Gang. Funktown was led by Harvey Wissenton. It is noteworthy that he began his career under the leadership of Mitchell, at one time was even a lookout for one of the streets, but was expelled from the ranks of the gang. The cause of this cord was a woman who preferred Wissenton to another subordinate of Mitchell. Offended Wissenton tried to shoot his rival, but only seriously wounded him. When Mitchell learned of the incident, Wissenton's days in the gang were numbered. However, Mitchell's main rival was a former pimp, Mickey Moore. For a while, they were even friends, but the friendship came to an end after Moore's dealers began dealing heroin in the territory of Felix's gang. Their confrontation was characterized by an extreme degree of violence. It reached its peak in the late summer of 1980, and the press called it Bloody August. During that month, six people in Felix's gang were killed, and later Moore's men even managed to kidnap Mitchell's son. But after some time, they returned him alive and unharmed. Mitchell tried to keep up with his rival, his men armed with AR-15 assault rifles riddled several of Moore's cronies with bullets during one of their raids into enemy territory. The massacre caught the attention of the federal government. It finally took notice of what was happening on the outskirts of Oakland and put Mitchell and his cronies under surveillance. The investigation had been going on for about three years. Felix knew, so he decided to move from Oakland to San Fernando Valley, visiting his hometown only occasionally and when absolutely necessary. During one such visit, when Mitchell was visiting an injured associate in the hospital, in 1984, he was arrested. The investigation found him guilty of seven murders. The judge pointed out that although the investigation had no evidence that Felix personally committed the murders, the fact that they were carried out on his instructions were undeniable. Also at sentencing, the judge said that Mitchell's gang, which earned up to $500,000 a week, was responsible for the heroin addiction epidemic in Oakland. In 1985, Felix Mitchell was sentenced to life in prison to be served in Leavenworth Prison. By this time, all his rivals were already in prison. 
Harvey Whissington was arrested during a raid on his machine shop, which he was using as a cover. Mickey Moore was arrested the same year and later sentenced to a similar life sentence and a $2 million fine. However, after some time, he was able to obtain a pardon and after being released, went into religion. He still preaches in one of the churches in Oakland. A year after his conviction, two days before his 32nd birthday, Felix was murdered in prison. The investigation determined that Mitchell was the victim of a domestic dispute. He had asked one of the young inmates to buy him fresh fruit with $10. The inmate failed to buy them, for which he was beaten by Felix and several of his cronies. A few hours later, when Felix was sleeping in his cell, the insultant man snuck in and stabbed the sleeping man 10 to 14 times. However, there is a version that Mitchell was killed by rivals who feared that the former drug lord would want to cooperate with the investigation. Some sources also say that Felix Mitchell was killed because of $10 that he owed to prison drug dealers. On August 29, 1986, perhaps one of the most controversial funerals in Oakland history took place. According to reporters' accounts, about 8,000 people saw Felix off on his final journey. Half of these people sincerely mourned the passing of a man who, in their opinion, had done so much for the prosperity of his native neighborhood and was its protector. The other half wondered why a murdered drug dealer was being honored with honors worthy of a war hero. Among these people were members of the Drug Enforcement Administration. To the displeasure of those around them, they arrived on the block in a red Ferrari that had previously been confiscated from Mitchell. Positioned in front of the church where the memorial service was being held, they took pictures of all of its guests. Apparently, in this way, they hoped to capture Felix's successor as gang leader. However, with the death of their leader, the gang faded into oblivion. Drugs from the neighborhood did not disappear, and instead of the precarious order that Felix provided, there was an era of lawlessness. Many small gangs began a bloody struggle for the redistribution of the sphere of influence. Sociologists even named the paradox after Felix Mitchell, a situation in which after the arrest of a gang boss or murder, as in the case of Mitchell, the crime rate does not fall, but on the contrary, increases many times over. Felix's departure triggered a power vacuum that too many people wanted to fill. The 69th Avenue gang was replaced by new younger and greedier groups that could not keep power in their hands. They were also extremely violent, turning the streets of Oakland into one continuous battlefield. In 1987, a year after his death, Felix was back in the headlines as his conviction was overturned. The Court of Appeals ruled that the conviction could not stand because the defendant had died before the appeal was heard. Moreover, all his assets confiscated earlier were returned to his relatives. Felix's biography was able to inspire director Mario Van Peebles. In 1991, his movie New Jack City was released, the main role in which was played by Wesley Snipes. His hero was a fictional drug dealer, Nino Brown, whose life path was reproduced from the biography of Felix Mitchell, as well as the notorious King of Harlem, Leroy Nicky Barnes, the story of which you can also watch on our channel.